About half the nation's hospitals include arts programming, and the number is growing. One of the leading institutions studying how art can assist in recovery is the University of Florida's Arts and Medicine program, which offers its own degree. Jeffrey Brown recently visited the artists in resident Helping to Heal. It's part of our arts and culture series, Canvas. For nearly her entire life, 18-year-old Kinsey Bogart has come to the hospital three days a week for more than four hours at a time for dialysis, attached to a machine which saves her life. And here at the University of Florida Shands Hospitals, part of Kinsey's therapy also includes art. Today, she and fellow patient Andy Herrera Reyes are painting while undergoing treatment. We do um, painting, drawing, sculpting, crafts. Sarah Hines is an artist in her own right. Some of her glass blown works are elsewhere in the hospital. And an artist in residence, working three days a week with patients and families, including Quan Howard and his mother, Chantel Davis. Months after a stroke in March, Quan suffers from expressive aphasia, a communication disorder that makes it difficult to speak. Art and music have a way of taking us outside of ourselves. Um, so Quan can get out of these four walls when he's painting this owl. You like Sarah, working with Sarah? Yeah. <laughs> we have a good time. We laugh a lot, huh? Yeah. It's escapism, it's, it's a distraction, but it's a connection, most of all. The troubles will come. Michael Clater is a musician in residence, performing for and sometimes with patients. People are very vulnerable here. I'm always surprised how many people are willing to welcome me into their room. Many, many people, most people say yes and, and want music in these dire moments and in what might be the most stressful time of their life. We watch Clater sing for Dave Derbyshire, a 68-year-old patient recovering from a double lung transplant. He came over. I was at the lowest point in my journey at that, right at that moment. It was a game changer for me, and it just lifted my spirits uh, exponentially at, at a very dark time in that recovery process. It's incredibly fulfilling for me. It's, I, I, I leave patient rooms all the time in disbelief that this is my job, this is what I get to do. That job is part of the hospital's Arts in Medicine program, bringing the arts directly into patient rooms, on walls and ceilings, in lobbies and spaces throughout. It began small back in 1990. When I came to Gainesville, uh, for family reasons, I discovered this little arts and medicine program was bubbling up at the hospital. And I had what really was my first life epiphany. I realized I could be an artist in a healthcare setting. A professional dancer earlier in life, Jill Sonke began her work here dancing at the bedside of patients. Years of study and practice later, with a PhD in arts in public health, She's the research director of the program and a leading figure in the field. No one is suggesting in arts and health that the arts can replace medicine or health care or other therapies or interventions. But the arts have a place in, in the sphere of whole person care. Um, there are so many ways in which the arts can address things like loneliness and social isolation. So you do see, I mean, we're at a shifting point where this is becoming more normal. It is, it is, yeah. So we're at a moment where, you know, patients can expect to be able to engage creatively as a part of the holistic care that they receive in hospitals. It wasn't always that way. Not only were those things not accepted, they were shunned. It wasn't viewed as a humane thing to do. It was viewed as you might actually be unwanted here in this scenario. Dr. Michael Oaken is a neurologist who's been with the arts and medicine program since he was a medical student. He says there's now an understanding that this goes even beyond the bedside human connection. Absolutely. The brain networks are changing, and so dopamine appears in the reward network. We see the network for memory, the network for facial expression. All of these things change, and as these networks change, diseases change. And as our, our brains change, our symptoms change. This Parkinson patient can't stop painting, so there's about 15 
layers of paint on here. And you have to Dr. Oaken is now chair of neurology at the, the University of Florida kind of College of Medicine and director of the Norman Fixel Institute for Neurological Diseases, where the walls are lined with art done by patients battling brain disorders of all kinds. How integrated would music and other arts be into care? I think it's, it's going to be a staple I think it's going to be something that's expected, that you go to the hospital and you're going to have access to these things. And we need to think about it not only just in terms of the medicine, but in terms of the healing. And we need to think about it not only in terms of our lifespan, but our health span. How long will we live and how long will we live well? That can happen in many ways. We're looking to see if music can be used to improve the experience. In an interdisciplinary research lab, students and faculty study connections that could make their way into therapies. Jill Sankey is also interested in what's known as social prescription, the idea that art or art experiences can be prescribed by doctors, just like medication. It's a concept that's gained traction in the United Kingdom and other countries, but not yet here. So we really need to explore what would a social prescribing model look like in the United States? And even that language, you know, can be a little bit problematic in the U.S. I would think it'd be very problematic for many people. Yeah, so we're looking at models for the United States wherein access to the arts through a health provider mm -hmm. can provide access to people who maybe aren't engaging in the arts yet or don't understand their health benefits. But we're also looking at a system wherein it can just provide direct access, where there's more arts and cultural activities available in a community. A new initiative in Gainesville called Spark 352 aims for just that, bringing art directly to people, especially historically more marginalized communities. Part of what we're doing is trying to provide activities and services and opportunities and access for people to get what they need as individuals to lead healthy lives. Dion Champion, who studied and worked as a chemical engineer before becoming a dance educator, is a research assistant professor with the Center for Arts in Medicine and co-director of SPARK 352. So we are happy to welcome you as part of She led an opening event at a Gainesville community center, complete with a story circle, performances, and art making. Our vision of how this whole thing comes together is that we see arts as being at the core of healthy communities. So when people have the opportunity to engage creatively in the space, then cities and communities become beautified. Then cities and communities become far more active and the people in those communities become more engaged um, in their own community development. The hope now is to use this as a model for similar programs in cities around the country. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown in Gainesville, Florida.